Hello there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Steve. I'm blind, and it is currently December 31st, 2019. We're about to hit another decade, folks. And uh, this is uh, the last podcast of 2019. Didn't really do much in the podcasting in 2019, but I mean, I tried. <laughs> um, if you're watching this on a video side, I've actually kind of uh, changed my like setup a little bit. Uh, like, you, you can't really see it 100%, but essentially the camera is not like in front of me as it used to be. It's actually kind of a bit above me because one of the things that um, uh, that I'll get to in a minute is sort of certain things that I've kind of been able to upgrade and, and blind gamer what's kind of essentially going to be uh be some kind of new things adding into the setup of my uh sort of studio as it were uh that i'll get to in a sec what uh, sort of what's upcoming in 2020 um but i wanted to at least record this very informal non sequitur if that's i, I don't know basically a just a, a, a rambling state of uh blind gamer um or at least is uh, of steve sailor uh of the past decade i won't don't worry it's not gonna be super long but i wanted to at least uh stream of consciousness that's the phrase i was looking for that i was uh i wanted to be able to do i i wanted to plan this out i wanted to at least have some like bullet points of certain things i wanted to touch on um, but I, I felt it was just a little bit more natural, a little bit more authentic if I just sort of just turn on the camera, turn on the mic, and here we go. Um, first off, I kind of want to do a bit of a retrospective in regards to 2019. 2019 was uh, a very interesting year for me. Um, it uh, it started off on a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, and I'm not going to sort of like say all the kind of the bad things about 2019 because it was amazing good things that honestly what happened at the beginning of the year um, was a blessing in and of itself that I would not have been able to do all the things I've been able to do this year if it if I was still working at uh, or at that particular. Basically, the, the, the starting off the year of being laid off was not exactly the the way I wanted to start off 2019, um, but he, that's what happened. Uh, I lost uh, my job that I've been working at. Actually, it would have been al it would have been almost ten years. Um, I, I worked at, at that pat particular um, job in radio, and uh it made like thinking about that today sort of made me think about sort of the trajectory or at least my path uh my journey my life path um over the past decade uh i started off the decade uh literally about to graduate college for radio um in, in january 2010 i was in my last semester of uh, my radio program at humber college and i was excited to finally start getting into the radio industry. That was my goal. I was training for two, actually for longer than the, the program I was in at Humber was a two year program. And before that I was in, the, uh, I was in a different radio broadcasting program um, that only lasted about a year. Um, it technically took a little bit longer because I decided to stick around to get sort of what they call the general arts and science diploma. It's basically just a basic college diploma saying that you at least graduated from some sort of post-secondary education. Uh, but in reality, it was, it was me trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And when I took the broadcasting course, uh, at the previous college I was at, uh, I didn't fit in that, uh, that super well. Um, mainly actually even thinking about it now, it was a partially because of my blindness. I won't mention the college specifically, but there was at one point, so the, the broadcasting course, the way they had it set up at that college was, uh, it wasn't like it was specifically to radio, TV, or film. It was all three kind of put together in that first year of a two-year program. You're supposed to basically try everything. And then the second year, instead of sort of separating it out into radio, TV, and film, they sort of split it off into two pathways of production and presentation. Production uh, essentially, you are you, you're doing film. Uh, you're also doing behind the scenes of TV, uh, and that's about it. Whereas presentation, you are uh, you're on the air for radio, and you're also on the air for TV, but you don't really but you don't do any film. 
Um, and the problem that I had going into knowing I was going into presentation uh, before the uh, at the end of my uh, some f first or, or my first year, I went to the program coordinator and I said, um, so unfortunately, because I'm blind, I wouldn't be able to see the teleprompter. I know that the presentation portion relies on teleprompter type work a lot. And I wanted to ask what they had, what they had available for me, what I could be able to do. Um, and unfortunately, uh, they basically said, well, we don't have any accommodations for you. We don't know. We have never done this before. Um, so the best solution that we have is you're going to have to memorize scripts. And just uh, like when I was told that the thing, the thought in my brain kind of Kicked, kicked off and I was like, well, if I have to memorize scripts, I know how these students are. I know that majority of the time, these scripts are probably going to be written at that morning. And that's not enough time for me to be able to memorize and to be able to give my best performance on camera as much as a hundred percent as I can, because I'm, I'm having to memorize scripts because I couldn't see the teleprompter and they weren't able to help me out. And for years, I actually thought that TV was not a thing for me at all because of that moment in that particular time. Um, now this is, this is uh, uh, like in 2007, 2007, I think, or two, no, 2008. Um, and so that's when I decided to go into Humber College to go specifically into radio because I thought, okay, if I can't do TV, I still wanna do presentation and radio was the other option. So I, I was passionate about radio. I wanted to do that. It wasn't like I was going into it to be like a sort of TV personality. I thought that would have been cool, but radio was always the passion for me. So I never really um, uh, wanted to do anything else but that. So when I went to uh, Humber College, I already had a year's worth of radio broadcasting experience in uh, the previous college. So I was a little bit ahead out of everyone else who was just starting out. Also, I was a little bit older than uh, than most of the students. So I was kind of like the parent or sort of the grandpa of the group. Uh, and I always had essentially a, the, the, a, a much more easier time to build, at least with that first year, because I already knew a lot of at least the production side and the creative writing side. There was a lot of things I still learned within that first year, but uh, it was essentially, I had, a, I, I had a bit of a leg up when it came to um, radio. And so it jump, jumping to the first half of 2010, essentially work, working my way towards getting a job in radio, um, that was the goal. There was no... There was no other option for me. Um, not to say that I was out of options. It's just that that, to me, I was so like laser focused on getting a job in radio um, because it was something I loved it when I was a kid. I loved listening to the radio uh, as a teenager, more so of the old old uh, time radio, like all the Orson Welles, War of the Worlds kind of style, like plays and, and shows that they used to do. I would listen to them all, uh, like every week and I would record them on cassette tape. Yes, kids, there was a thing called cassette tape that I actually used to have. And I also used to have a Walkman too. And I would listen to those radio programs literally all day, every day, as much as I could throughout the entire week until I can record a new program the following Sunday. Uh, and I, I listened to a lot of that. I also listened to a lot of stand-up comedy that way. I would record a lot of stand-up comedy. I would just sort of listen to it back and forth. I would record it on cassette tape. I just, that's actually how I would develop my sense of humor was because of that. So radio was always something that that, that was something I needed to do. So when uh, April of 2010 uh, hit and I was almost on my semester, like my uh, last semester, all this entire time I was sort of like trying to, like I was applying to a bunch of different places, a bunch of different stations. I didn't care where it was, preferably Ontario, but it had to be a place essentially that I could be able to get to. And uh, I, I applied and didn't really get, uh, I, I had a few sort of options, but the one option I had was working in digital uh, on the digital side of uh, of a radio station, and I was told at the time this is a great way to be able to get your foot in the door and get you at least into a station, and then you can be able to kind of push towards whatever you wanted to be able to do. Um, the first station I worked at was a very small station in a very small town in uh, in Ontario, and it was great for the time that I was there, but I was still wanting to uh, to get into more of the broadcast or the announcing kind of role instead of just the behind the scenes digital side. Then I was given the opportunity to move back to Toronto 
uh, to basically do the same job that I was doing in this small town, but uh, on a grander scale at a station that was that was one of the largest uh, in in the country. And so uh, I was I, I was offered that I wasn't offered that position. I was at, like asked if I wanted to apply, um, not from the station itself, but from one of my professors. They encouraged me to to apply to that because they knew some people there. And they said, well, I remember what they said it's like I know it's like it seems like it's sort of a uh, a side step for your career, but uh, this could be a good opportunity for you to at least bitch get you back into Toronto. I was like, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And then I was at that same job for eight years. Um, it was uh, it, it kind of expanded a little bit. Um, when a second station kind of got added into the mix where I had to run the digital and I had a lot of fun. There was a lot of things I got to sort of incorporate into, um, their sort of uh, digital, uh, footprint as it were. And I was very proud of the work that I was able to do with the web series I was able to produce, um, the content I was able to produce and even just starting to, uh, near the end, like, start, like the, in my la within my last year there, starting to add like a, a live streaming element, uh, online through, um, using some of the same practices that, I use today in all my live streaming and recording. Um, it was sort of like a, a great marriage of, of, of the, the skills that I had um, and working within the career that I, that I had. And then uh, uh, then in the middle of all this, uh, in 2015, February 2015, uh, that's when I started doing Blind Gamer. I was always doing stuff on my own. I was always creating content on my own. Uh, but it was um, it was sort of like it, it, like I would start a few projects and it just never really worked out. Um, as my, some of my friends uh, uh, call it, uh, it, it was sort of my dead baby stage, uh, where essentially I would create something and then I would just sort of kill it uh, almost right away, uh, but with, without giving it a lot of chance to grow. There was a few things I, I, I started that I was able to kind of grow, and I, uh, but I was able to pass off to other people to help uh, to run it, and they ran it much better than, than I ever could, and, I, and uh, I was very proud of that. But there was a lot of my own personal projects that essentially I started, and then I stopped. That was sort of my thing. It was sort of like it, I started something, and then I realized it wasn't for me, so then I stopped. And uh, it, it could be seen as a good thing. It can also be seen as a bad thing. I usually recommend it as a good thing because at least then it gives you permission to fail so that you can be able to keep working and trying different things so you can find something that you can succeed in. And uh, all throughout the, basically 2010 to 2015, uh, I didn't really, uh, I didn't really do, like, I did a bunch of stuff. And then even when I started Blind Gamer, I was still sort of thinking of doing some other things and some of the other projects that I was still kind of currently working on. Uh, and I just sort of thought, ah, you know what, Blind Gamer is kind of like a, my own little personal project that essentially I could have fun with. Uh, that was the, that was just the gist of it. It was just, I wanted to have fun playing video games because I hadn't played video games at that point. Um, and I'll get into sort of my my thoughts on on, on the past decade in video games uh, in a bit, but uh, I didn't expect this to be sort of like a retrospective of 2010 to 2019. But here we are. Uh, and so in February 2015, I essentially uh, that's that's when Blind Gamer started. And you've heard me probably tell this story uh, plenty of times on how I got started. I won't sort of bore you with that uh, now, but. Uh, the shortened version essentially was I started off as creating it as entertainment value, as becoming a Let's Player with a, a niche of the fact that I'm blind and I suck at video games and it's more funny to watch me fail at video games than it is for me to do well. That was the uh, the premise of it and that was the like the beginning stages of it. And then um, it wasn't until two years later where I essentially um, sort of my eyes were open, pun intended, to the accessibility side of uh, video games and how what I hadn't realized over over the past decade uh, previous to that um, there was a lot of people trying to be able to push for accessibility in video games and in, uh, it, it, in 2017 it was that was when I was um, sort of like that's when I sort of discovered it um, or at least it discovered me and uh, I think I've told, I can't remember if I told the story on the podcast or at least uh, uh, I've told, I know I've told the story before on interviews and a few things, but um, I remember the exact moment when I sort of uh, realized that my content needed to switch. And that was when I was on stage at uh, the UX summit in 2017, it was run by Ubisoft and essentially where I was in a room 
full of game developers from many studios, from Epic Games, from Bungie, from Naughty Dog, from uh, Sony Santa Monica, uh, from EA, uh, from Ubisoft, and they were all in the room. And the day that I was there, it was like a two-day um, summit. The second day was all about accessibility. And I didn't realize that when I was going in, because I was when I was asked, it was I was asked to be on a panel to talk about my experiences uh, as a blind gamer. And I, from, uh, what I what I didn't what I soon began to realize was that I was the only gamer in the room. I mean, they were all gamers, but the, I was the only uh, person that was there that uh, an expert, uh, as it will, uh, as you will, that wasn't in the game development side of video games. I was on the content creation. I was a I was a YouTuber. I was a content creator. Uh, and so the panel that I was on was about accessibility and. There are there were at least uh, two people on that panel that uh, that I didn't realize that actually that I would become uh, pretty good friends with um, that were that, that basically they were all talking in, in a very uh, a sort of like they were experts. They were the true experts in accessibility because they had worked on it. They had done game development. And I sort of was it was halfway through that that panel that I finally realized, oh, shoot. The entire time I used to think that video game that I just sucked at video games, it was at that moment that I realized that video games suck for me this entire time, and that my entire um, premise of Blind Gamer as a channel or as a um, a, a series, as uh, essentially who I who I am, shifted um, into wanting to be able to pursue uh, accessibility in video games and to be able to make it and hopefully help. Um, the game developers be able to make their games more accessible. And that was in 20, end of 2017, in October 2017. So for the past two years since then, uh, I've been trying to push for more accessibility. And um, uh, and I couldn't figure out any sort of a way to do it, whether it was just to work freelancing for studios. Um, and I did a few, uh, I did a bit of that. Um, and there was some amazing people that, uh, that I got to work with in a few projects, um, some of which will be coming out very soon, which I'm very happy about. Um, and you'll get to sort of see like some of the work that was put, the amazing work that was put into, uh, some of these games. And, uh, ever since then, uh, I've been, I've been sort of, I, I love the, the idea of sort of being an advocate for accessibility because there's amazing accessibility consultants in the industry there. And, and I'm happy to say that they are my friends. Um, and, what, one of the things that, that, uh, like, uh, that I hope I can be able to do is at least be a voice um, not necessarily the face of, uh, of accessibility in video games, but at least be a voice in communities that don't necessarily uh, talk about accessibility often. It's sort of like, um, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy to be the, uh, the light post that can sort of, um, uh, th that can sort of light the way uh, towards the idea of accessibility for those who may have not thought about accessibility in that way. And 2019 was sort of like the, for me, the linchpin uh, year of that, because being on Kind of Funny Games Daily twice, which is something I never thought would even happen once, uh, and this and it happened twice within the same year, uh, roughly. I mean, it was twenty eight end of 2018 and the, be the beginning of 2019, but I still consider that within the first year, uh, within a year. Um, and being able to... Being able to go to places like E3 and PAX East and being on a panel with What's Good Games. I mean, like, what? Seriously? Um, being a, a panelist at a GA conference, this game accessibility conference, um, at, at, like not part of GDC, but during GDC when developers already in town for talking about accessibility, basically being in another room full of game developers. Uh, and then uh, being like, like, like I said already, but going to E3. That was a dream of mine since I was a, like, I started watching Electric Playground or X Play, uh, like, and they would all do these coverages of E3. And I'm like, man, it'd be cool to be able to go there and just it's, like see all the kind of video games. And the fact that this year was the first year I got to go, minus the the fact that Sony uh, dropped out of uh, of coming and, and all the controversy of the, the media list after that. Um, I, 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 like, it was still one of the best experiences I ever had was being able to be there, be on the ground floor of what's to come in, uh, video games within the next few years and being a chance to having a chance to be able to play some of the games that were there, 
uh, that haven't come out yet. Like that to me is still pretty cool. Like being able to play games that like are like soon everyone will be able to play and and I and uh, being able to ha like talk about it was really really cool. So and and basically kind of like leading up to this year, this year was like a huge roller coaster. Like throughout the entire time of me still trying to be able to find like paid work. Um, I wouldn't have had, like, it, it, like I said, if I was working full time, I would not have had the same opportunities that I've had, um, this year. Uh, I would not have been able to go to E3. Uh, I would not have been able to go to PAX, uh, PAX East. I would not have been able to go to uh, like basically for San Francisco and GDC, not have been able to go on kind of funny games daily. Uh, like it would basically would, none of those things would have happened if I was still working full time. Sure. I had vacation days where I can do it, but I would have put my job into jeopardy. And I think sort of the, my bosses sort of saw that, that there was certain things that I was doing that not that not necessarily sort of negate like uh i i was it was i was competing against them or creating content like i was sort of like my focus was uh, somewhere else but i think that from what i like from what i was told from my bosses like you, you 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 like you were working towards something different and um and in a small way they were like this is sort of your opportunity to be able to take it uh take advantage of and take the bull by the horns and essentially and just run with it. And uh, 2019 was that year for me, uh, being able to create amazing content this year, being able to talk to so many people, uh, and, uh, and and being able to work with some of the amazing developers. I can't wait. Like basically, now this is leading into what I'm want to be able to do in 2020. I can't wait for 2020. Not only just for the the amount of things I'm uh, I'm looking forward to being able to do uh, the, uh, this year it's uh like this coming year in 2020 but it's it starts off essentially a decade another decade of what i uh will essentially be another uh chapter into my life this it, beginning of this it's kind of poetic in a way and it's very kind of literal in uh, just if you think about it in regards to chapters and sort of the like the uh, of the book of my life or the book of steve sailor i started off this decade starting out in a career that I wanted to, that I wanted to be in in radio, and then ending this decade with jumping into another career and another, and what I feel is this is what I was. I always feel like every person on this planet was put on this planet for something um, that they were meant to do, not something that they like they necessarily want to do or uh, like it, it's just something that they were born with that they were meant to do whether they believe that's from God or from fate or for the universe or destiny, whatever. There is always some, there is something that you were put on this planet meant to do. Sometimes it could be being a parent. Sometimes it could be being uh, a, a, a partner and, and a supporter for a, a person to be able to realize their dreams. It could also be uh, in, in any sort of career passion you have, but I feel that there is always something. There's always something that you can that you are meant to do on this uh, on this planet. And I feel that being a, a, an accessibility advocate and and doing this blind gamer, this is what I was meant to do. So even ju so, jumping into 2020 into this new chapter of my life, something that I never a, 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 a decade ago I would never thought possible. I was so focused on radio video games and my blindness wasn't sort wasn't even like and, and being able to sort of combine the two together and, and becoming accessibility advocate that was not even a, a, like an idea that I had all this entire time um it was like before I even started blind gamer it was like it was like I was not even video games weren't even a thing that I want to do at that point like a beginning of the decade I wasn't really playing video games that much um, and actually there was a period of like a couple years there where I stopped playing altogether. And so to say that, like to, to, if I was to talk to Steve in 2010, as compared to Steve in 2020, um, it, we would have two completely different conversations as to where we thought we were. Um, and, uh, or what we were meant to do. And I, I'm excited for 2020. Uh, there are certain things that, that I would love to be able to talk about that I can't just yet. Not that I like it, it hasn't been things haven't been announced yet. There actually are a few things that haven't been announced yet that, that I'm excited to be able to do uh, in, in, in 2020. Um, 
but uh, like I, I can't talk about it just yet. Uh, it's there are things happening that they, they'll be able to talk about really soon. Um, there's even something that I'm doing this week that actually uh, will uh be uh, talked about very, like it's, it's regards to one thing that will be that will be launching very soon but um basically this 2020 is going to be a, a year of brand new projects brand new things and also uh in just regards to the channel itself and regards to blind gamer as a podcast uh, I has to have plans for that. I want to be able to step that up more. I want to be able to stream more. I want to be able to create more content. Uh, my studio is sort of uh, in a place where I can be able to at least be able to easily create more content. Uh, I, one of the things that I, uh, two of the things that I was able to get this holidays, I hope you had a happy holidays. I hope you had a great Christmas uh, or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa, whichever you celebrate. Uh, one of the things, uh, two things I was able to get, uh, pick up. And if you haven't seen the video that uh, of my unboxing of this, I would definitely recommend checking it out. I got the uh, Xbox Elite 2 controller. Uh, I was playing around with it a little bit today. Uh, I will be doing a full review of it at some point. Um, at least from my use of it and in regards to the accessibility side of things. But uh, I will I will talk about that soon once I kind of run this through the paces. Um, but also one thing you can't really see right now uh, because uh, and, and also sort of explains a little bit of the weird sort of camera angle that I'm used to uh, is that I upgraded my uh, like sort of monitor, computer monitor slash uh, like gaming uh, TV. Essentially, I used to have this 42 inch uh, screen that essentially that was active my, as my computer monitor and my gaming um, TV for my consoles. Uh, but uh, this holiday I was able to upgrade to a 50 inch 4K TV that is acting as my monitor and my gaming setup. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a TCL four series 50 inch uh, TV. And so far, I've been playing around with it. Took a little bit to figure out sort of studio setup wise. I had to literally unplug everything off my desk from my computer to all my consoles and just to be able to kind of get everything set up because this TV takes up a huge portion of the desk. <laughs> and um, already, I'm even I'm, I'm seeing the benefits of it. Like the fact that, I mean, it's about like, well, yeah, it's about a foot and a half uh, away from me. And already I'm seeing the, the accessibility benefits. Like I'm able to see a lot more clearly. I was playing some uh, Red Dead Redemption 2 uh, with it. And my God, the 4K is gorgeous. Oh, c couldn't get HDR to work for some reason. It's a whole other thing. But the 4K, whoo, it's gorgeous. And even with the 50 inch screen, um, even with the small text in Red Dead Redemption 2, I was able to really like see it without necessarily having to use the zoom feature as much as I was with the 42 inch screen. Uh, I'm hoping that this won't sort of like this won't spoil me for any of the games that are coming out. That I, if if I notice that there's any small text within a within a game that I'll need to talk about. Um, but for right now, this is a great screen for for me to be able to play video games with, and I'm able to see a lot better um, with this with this TV. So I'm really excited to be able to kind of run that through its paces uh, over the next little while. But essentially, it it's a it's got a big footprint. Um, it's got some it's got some girth. <laughs> it's uh, like I actually had to measure my desk just to make sure that it could fit. Um, thank God, actually, technically it could fit about a 60 inch and I will go like kind of like from edge to edge of the desk. Um, but I didn't want to go that high. <laughs> I could have, I could have, uh, but I mean, it's a little bit expensive to really kind of go that high, but at least a 50 inch, it's a decent upgrade for me to be able to like, it's a, actually, I do notice the difference. Uh, so I'm excited for that to be able to help with uh, being able to create more content, uh, which is great. And uh, in 2020, essentially, I don't know, like I have a few ideas of what I'm uh, gonna be doing over the next like first half of 2020, um, but who knows what'll, what'll come up within the next little while. Uh, I don't know if I'm just going to be freelancing this entire time, if I'm going to be work, if I'm going to get a full-time job in, in something, or I don't know. Uh, I'm going to have to like, it, it's going to be interesting. I, that's, it's the first time in, in, in a long time that I don't know what I'm going to be doing over the next, uh, year. Um, actually, I don't even, sometimes I like, I don't even know hundred percent of what I'm going to be doing over the next few months. Um, and it's not even just sort of me being upset about it. It's sort of, uh, I, I sort of, there's, I've been kind of working towards certain things that um, I'm excited to be able to try and excited to be able to do and hopefully uh, be able to 
do more of these, do more of these podcasts and maybe bring on some of my friends to be able to chat with. Um, and I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to do podcasts more. I want to be able to stream more. I want to be able to create more content um, because I feel like that's something that I can I can do. I can lend my voice towards and and hopefully be able to educate people on accessibility and and sort of bring to light uh, all these amazing things that my my accessibility friends are doing. Uh, and whether that's uh, through consulting or through just advocacy in general, I will try my best to be able to uh, to be a, 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 the best advocate or consultant I can be. So, uh, as far as video games in regards to the past decade, I don't want to give like sort of my, my, like, I don't want to turn this into like a, like, here's my best of the year or best of, uh, of 2019, or even like, here's my, like the best accessible, like accessible games of 2019 or the best accessible games of the decade. I'm not qualified to be able to kind of uh, to offer that uh, that kind of suggestion um, uh, without having to uh, this be like a, 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 a I would I would need a lot more help uh, in that regard uh, from some of my friends to be able to uh, to help even sort of come up with even nominees for something like that. Um, I can say that though that the games that I enjoyed this year uh, were Control, uh, Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, and that's kind of about it <laughs> uh i actually you know what? i won't throw in destiny in there and even though the destiny i started playing in, in october 2018 i'm still playing it uh to this day and it's the game that i didn't even expect to be able to keep playing over the past year uh i've been being able to play with some of my friends have been absolutely fantastic uh for this so i'm i i, I do enjoy that so that's basically been the three games that i kind of enjoyed the most was yeah control uh star wars jedi fallen order and um and destiny and that's kind of it uh well minecraft actually was thrown into there too that's when i kind of really got into my like i actually like it finally clicked as far as like what minecraft is and i'm like oh i get it now um so i would say that the but that, then again that didn't come up this year it just sort of became super popular again maybe because of pewdiepie i don't know that's my theory is that because of pewdiepie is playing it again that's where sort of everyone uh uh like started to kind of really look into minecraft and be like oh yeah this is actually pretty good so uh those are the games i enjoyed this year as far as like games of the decade that i that uh, that i really enjoyed that um i was able to play uh the first red dead redemption that's kind of why i was sort of getting back into red dead redemption too because i was sort of in a nostalgia mode of like yeah like i love that game that was for a long time that was my game the game best game of all time uh and then when red dead 2 came out i enjoyed it um but i couldn't get past like chapter two essentially but now I, uh, uh, like I started back up again just recently and I'm now in chapter five. I've, I've, I've become ex obsessed with the, with the game again. So, uh, I, I don't know how far I have left to go. I didn't, I, I'm trying to avoid going back into like in spoilers. So I'm hoping that I can build an, I know there's a few things coming up, but, um, I'm excited to keep playing that for a bit, but yeah, Red Dead Redemption was sort of my game, of, uh, one of my games of the decade. Uh, Zelda Breath of the Wild was definitely a game of the decade for me. Uh, that game was the first Zelda game I really uh, was able to try and being able to play it on a brand new Nintendo platform. And I was like, I bought it, I bought this, uh, the Switch about a month after it came out. And uh, that was the first game I bought was, uh, was Zelda. And uh, literally th for the first two months of me having it, I was playing Zelda every single day. Uh, I was playing it at home. I was playing it on the streetcar on the way to work. Uh, every day uh, and back again and it was just a game I just could not put put down until I finished it um, actually there's a few videos I've created of, of, of that uh, on my channel if you want to be able to check them out uh, including me uh, defeating uh, Calamity Ganon uh, for the first time and uh, being able to actually like complete a Zelda story for the first time that was something that was really cool so Breath of the Wild was definitely a game of the decade for me um, I will also say God of War from 2018. Um, that game was an amazing achievement uh, that I was had so much fun playing. Um, accessibility aside, for, and that's thing I will say a lot of these accessibility aside, they're not like the most accessible games. These are just games that I enjoyed uh, that I was able to play. Um, so this is these are not endorsements as far as accessibility uh, or like had really good accessibility. These are just games that uh, I just had fun with. Uh, God of War definitely is one is one of those games that I just had a, a blast 
playing, uh, and I hope uh, and I hope they're going to be releasing a sequel. I would imagine they're going to be doing a sequel to that. Uh, like I, I can't even think of a, 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 a like of a of a, a like a, a reason why they wouldn't. Um, but also, Last of Us. I finally was able to finish that this decade, even though it's, it came out in 2013. It took me seven years to finally be able to play it and beat it. Uh, but I did, and I will be doing that on my channel soon. I do have, I, I, I've recorded all of it. I've, I've finished the, playing the game, I've I recorded all of it. I just need to actually sit down and edit it. It's a lot of footage, so I need to sit down and edit it, and, and I will put the, finally finish that playthrough on my channel, uh, which I'm really excited to be able to do. Um, so you'll see that. Uh, at least, so yeah, Last of Us uh, definitely is in there. Uh, Assassin's Creed Origins was uh, it, it was in there. I'd say also throw an Odyssey into that as far as my games of the decade uh, because those are the first Assassin's Creeds that I was actually able to play and enjoy. And I played a lot of them over the past decade, and uh, I'd say almost every single one. And they were I could not play them at all. Uh, the closest I ever got was uh, Assassin's Creed Three, and um, it just got to the point where three quarters of the way through I just couldn't play it anymore. Um, but I, uh, Origins and Odyssey were kind of the two that I really, really enjoyed. And I do want to be able to finish Odyssey at some point, too. I haven't finished that yet. I'm about like three quarters of the way through the story. I, I just, a lot of other games kind of came out that I just sort of wanted to be able to, uh, wanted to be able to, to play instead. Uh, but I will get back to that sort of the same way I've been getting back to Red Dead Redemption 2. And then there's a lot of other games that I know that are on other Game of the Decade lists um, that I just never really got a chance to play. Uh, and I'm, I'll am i maybe will at some point, but uh, I'd say, yeah, Red Dead Redemption, Breath of the Wild, and Assassin's Creed Origins and Odyssey and Last of Us were kind of the games of my decade that I enjoyed. I'd say, oh, shoot, I want to, do I throw in Tomb Raider into there? Ah, the reboot of Tomb Raider, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I'd say I throw that in there because that was a game that I that sort of got me back, like started back into video games again. Was playing that, um, maybe nah. I uh, I do enjoy it. I don't think that nah. I mean that uh, yeah sure throw that in there yeah yeah yeah. So those are my games of the decade: Red Dead Redemption, Breath of the Wild, Assassin's Creed Origins and Odyssey, Last of Us, and uh, the the re the rebooted Tomb Raider. Um, those were games that I personally enjoyed that I had a lot of fun with, uh, playing and I can't wait to see what 2020 comes like 2020 is going to be an amazing year for games. And I can't wait. Oh boy. Uh, Oh man. Most anticipated games I've got coming up, obviously for next year, cyberpunk, final fantasy seven remake, last of us part two. Um, Watch Dogs when when that comes out. I know it got delayed, but I'm looking forward to playing that still. Uh, those are just four of the games that I'm excited about. Ooh, Halo Infinite when that comes out too. Ooh, yeah, there's there's a lot. There's a lot. <laughs> and I'm excited. Uh, yeah, those are those are definitely games I can't wait to be able to play. So, uh, and I, yeah. Anyway, uh, that's it. This is it for this rambling nonsense. I've literally been, let me see, I've been recording for about 37 minutes. I I hope this was, it was entertaining at least to a certain degree. Um, but beyond that, uh, I just want to say thank you for this amazing decade. In 2020, this will be the fifth year that I started doing Blind Gamer. And um, I would not be here uh, if it wasn't for, um, if it wasn't for you. Uh, that's one thing that I'm that I am extremely grateful for and extremely thankful for over the past decade was being able to discover uh, this community, uh, this amazing accessibility community, but this amazing blind gamer community that I never thought would be possible. Um, I created content. For, I've been creating content for going on now almost 15 years, and this is the most fulfilled that I've ever had. Uh, and, and, and feeling like that I'm making a difference uh, in, in people's lives. Um, then, and that's not sort of being a, like a bragging sort of thing, but just have, like when I hear people sort of discovering me and discovering sort of accessibility, that means a lot. That means that, um, that the conversation and, and, and the voices uh, are only getting louder for accessibility. And um, when, as, as Phil Spencer says, like when everyone plays, we all win. 
that's sort of the mantra that uh, a lot of us in accessibility community sort of keep pushing forward um, and um, we'll keep pushing forward and for uh, for the next decade to come so um, and I've had some amazing amazing time like f like fulfilling things in my life I've I started two amazing podcasts with friends that I uh, that I absolutely loved um, I uh, that are still going to this day and I've created a bunch of different things but this is the one that personally is the most uh, satisfying the most fulfilling um, and I and I have you to thank for that um, by you sticking with me, sticking by my side for uh, for this long. Um, and so 2020 is not only just going to be an amazing year for Blind Gamer, but uh, or for myself, but it's an amazing year for Blind Gamer and the fact that five years ago in February uh, I started this crazy idea. You know what? It'd be fun to show how bad I am at video games, and I just decided to and I called it Blind Gamer. That was it. Um, so I guess I should probably start thinking about doing something in February, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah. So anyway, that's it. If you want to be able to follow me, you can follow me at Steve Saylor on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, I will be streaming more on Mixer.com slash Blind Gamer Steve uh, coming, uh, starting pretty soon. And uh, also, you want to, if you haven't subscribed yet to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash snowball, or on this podcast, go to any podcast uh, service that, that you use, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Play, uh, or whichever uh, podcast service you use. Uh, make sure you just search for Blind Gamer or Steve Saylor, and you should be able to find me. And make sure you subscribe. Well, I really appreciate it. And uh, leave a comment down below if you're watching this as, as a video of what you sort of uh, thought of. 20 uh, or 2010 to 2019 what was your favorite moments of the past decade what was your favorite gaming moments of the past decade i'd love to be able to hear your thoughts on it uh, make sure you like this video or, and, or like this episode and uh as always i remain obediently yours bye now to hit the stop recording button Yee.